Well, this morning we have a, a difficult topic to tackle, okay? We've come to the point in the Lord's Prayer uh, on forgiveness. Forgive us. I want to start by uh, quoting Henry Nowen. He says, It is impossible to lift our enemies up in the presence of God and at the same time continue to hate them. Let's just think about that statement real quick. It's impossible for us to lift up our enemies in the presence of God and at the same time continue to hate them. And thinking about that, let's start asking ourselves some very important questions to evaluate where we are in our prayer life. Are you praying for forgiveness, number one? And number two, are you praying for the ability to forgive? Open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 43 to 45. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes this, his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now let me ask you, how can you hate someone you're praying blessings for? Now, when it says pray for those who persecute you, it's not praying for persecution to come on them, okay? Let's get a clear thought here, a clear claim, a train of thought. When you are to pray for someone, you are praying for the Lord to reach out in blessings for them. How can you have a grudge against someone you're praying for, for the God of peace and love and grace to come upon them? In praying for them, something unique and something beautiful and something amazing takes place in your own life. The barriers of hate, the barriers of anger, the barrier, barriers of bitterness come down. And care and love comes on for, for them, for you. And there's something interesting that takes place in their life as well. As you're praying for them, they start to change as well. You see, we're praying for those we hate. For those we're angered at. Not for vengeance, but prayer of love, peace, and understanding. Forgiveness is a very powerful thing. It's someone telling another, I could be very angry and upset with you right now. I could let my bitterness and anger control me at this very moment. I could, in, I could go after you. I could yell, I could scream, I could throw a fit. But I want no ill will towards you. All is forgiven and forgotten. All is forgiven and forgotten. Forgiveness is a very common theme throughout Scripture. Take out your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 10. This is where we've been studying the past few weeks, and we're going to continue on until we finish Matthew 6. Starting in verse 9, it says, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And the verse we're going to open up today, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The Greek word here, aphilima, means both trespass and debt. Trespass and debt. Lord, forgive me my trespasses and forgive me my debts in life. By the time we get to this same prayer in, in the book of Luke, Luke changes the word in Luke 11 to the word sin. Lord, forgive me of my sins 
as I've forgiven the sins of others. Forgive the debts, forgive the trespasses, and forgive the sins in my life and the life of others. Lord, forgive me of my sins, just as I've forgiven the people around me that have wronged me, that have sinned against me, that have trespassed. It's saying, Lord, I've already taken a page out of your book and forgiven. And if we really break it down, how does Jesus forgive? Totally, completely. As he was sitting on the cross and he was nailed to it, hands and feet, the same men that beat him at night, kept him awake, tore the flesh from his bones and the beard from his face spat at him and called him names. He cries out in his voice, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You see, a lot of times we feel that we can just hold back in our forgiveness. We can hold on to it. It's kind of like our, our own little creature. But the scariest thing that's within this verse is the words, as we. I found it funny one day somebody left their Bible here, and I'm not going to say who, because I actually I don't think they're in this church anymore. <laughs> but one of the bookmarkers was in it, and it fell out, and we picked it up and put it back in for them. And it was at this verse, and I noticed that they had actually edited Matthew chapter 6. And if this is you, I apologize, but maybe you need some conviction right now. <laughs> and they had crossed out as we've forgiven our debtors. You see, a lot of times we go through Scripture and we edit the things that hurt us the most. And maybe you're doing some editing in your mind and saying, forgive my sins. And you're skipping over the last part. But the most hurtful things that you can read in this passage is what it says right here, as we, which suggests that we have already forgiven those that are in debt to us. And as it says here, they become no longer debtors. Lord, as I've gone ahead and I've scratched off the wrongs against me, and you scratched off the wrongs against you, Lord, I'm no longer holding any bitterness, any malice, any anger in my life towards this person. You see, what we're asking, Lord, Lord, is that a clean slate would be given. And this is exactly what we're being told to do. Take a look, if you will, in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. It says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, a log is in your own? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly enough to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. You will see clearly enough to confront the brother that's offended you. You'll see clearly enough to right the wrongs in your own life. It's not that God refuses to forgive that some people see within this passage. There's no bitterness or anything taking place with God. Bitterness is sin. Unforgiveness is a sin. And sin causes your relationship with the Lord to be affected. And that's what God is talking about here. This is what Christ is unfolding before us. If we allow unforgiveness to take place in our life, we're separating us ourselves from the relationship we have in Jesus Christ. Let's read on in Ephesians 4. Take a look at verses 31 and 32, if you would. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from among you, along with all malice. If we really break it down, these things are worthless to a believer. They're joy stealers. They take us away from what really matters. Our time in fellowship, which is few and far in between. If I'm holding something against you, oh, the joy of spending time with my brother or sister is just robbed from me. It just makes you upset and lose sight of God's will and God's plan for your life and the life of the church. Instead of focusing on God, you make your focus on the situation. Bitterness and anger and unforgiveness, it's, it's like taking a poison and expecting the other person to die. I'm angry at you and I'm bitter at you and I'm going to hold on to this unforgiveness in my life. And I'm going to watch you squirm under it. But that person's not affected. That person's living their life because they have no clue what's taking place in your life. They have no clue about the bitterness and anger and unforgiveness that's tearing you apart. And so they remain unaffected as you slowly die in your relationship to the Lord. The only person that hurts is you. Before killing yourself with this poison of unforgiveness, we need to do what is so hard to do and forgive. Don't hurt your relationship with Jesus Christ by losing focus on what we need to do and we're commanded to do and we're praying to do, which is to forgive. Verse 32, it keeps on, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. But what we're not realizing is that all of our sins were taken on the cross. And yes, it seems so easy and painless to give it up to Jesus, but He endured the pain of the cross for us. Look, our feelings of guilt, they're good. But we don't need to make penance for what Jesus already made penance for. It's true we need, deserve, and we, we should have terrible punishment for the things we do. But you know what the beauty of grace? Christ endured it for us. And you see, that's what happens in our spiritual life if we don't deal with forgiveness right away. Because maybe this right here that we've been talking about is hurting you a lot. But you got an infection that's growing inside of you right now. And you need to tear away that scab and let some healing take place. Because you didn't deal with it right away. And you didn't do what was right right away. Well, brothers and sisters, let's all do some peeling away together. Let's start some healing here at this church with one another, with our families, so we can come together in fellowship and in love. Let's pray. Dear precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for being a wonderful, merciful God. Lord, if there's someone here right now that have been hearing about this amazing forgiveness that you give, they're looking at these barriers and they're saying, man, I, I need some of that in my life. I need that forgiveness. I pray that they would open up right now. And Lord, if there's someone here right now that hasn't tasted your forgiveness, they still have been holding on to themselves. They're holding on to their sins and saying, well, maybe if I just do enough good things, I can get to heaven. Maybe if I just do enough good stuff and cover up all that bad, God's going to go ahead and look at me and say, well, you're not the greatest person, but you did just enough 
Well, I'm sorry to tell you, the Bible says you're good enough doesn't cut it. The only way to get to heaven is as John 6.47 tells us, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. You have to believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for every bad thing you've ever done. All the past, present, and future sins. All the past, present, and future wrongs. All the past, present, and future lies. All the past, present, and future bitterness and anger. He died for all those on the cross. And if he had just died, then we would be pitied. But the beautiful thing is, he rose again three days later. And just as we're promised in John 6, 47, the moment you put your trust in him, he who believes has eternal life. It's as beautiful as that, as easy as that, because he endured the hard part.